This video brought to you in part by Tommy in the Order of Cosmic Champions. This exciting and heartwarming coming of age Gen X novel is available now. Check the link for more info. Recently, I've looked at quite a few little toys and gadgets that allow us to play or replay our favorite games from the Atari 2600. Now, these range from released products like handhelds and plug and plays, but also we're looking at things coming in the future like the Pocket Player from my arcade. And regardless what kind of gadget I'm talking about, one thing that I keep bringing up again and again, and I don't really hear anyone else talking about it that much, is the TV type switch, that color black and white toggle that first appeared on the very first Atari 2600 and every subsequent release. And I guess I kind of get why people aren't talking about it that much. I mean, here we are in the 21st century, the digital age. Why would anybody talk about a Switch to make a game compatible with black and white TVs, right? I mean, who cares? Hey there, welcome back to Gen X Grown Up. I am John and I am a Gen X Grown Up. Thank you for the click. And in this video, I want to talk a little bit about that color black and white switch from the Atari 2600, what it was meant to do, what it does now, and why I believe it's an important part of the 2600 that should not be forgotten and should be included on any gadget that is going to play Atari 2600 titles. Now, I want to start with just a little bit of technical history behind the Atari 2600. We all recognize the image of the first Atari that had those six switches across the top, and we know what they are. You have power, color black and white, left difficulty, right difficulty, game select, game reset. You may find it interesting to know that aside from the power switch, those buttons don't do anything. Almost literally do nothing. All they do is they toggle the bit of a register that the game programmed for the Atari must know how to read and act upon. There's not some magical color black and white translation happening in the hardware. It's just a switch that it's up to the game to recognize this is a color black and white switch. Now you'll remember initially, only Atari made Atari 2600 games. This was before the idea of third-party developers that came along later, Activision, the Magic, things like that. So Atari just said, look, we'll tell our developers these bits, you must always recognize them. When you see someone throw this, it's a game reset. When you see someone throw this, it's difficulty on the right player. So it was up to the software developers to know what to do with those. And that's pretty much what we got for the first few years, at least, of the life of the Atari. Take the difficulty switches, for example. They are meant to be handicaps for more experienced players. If I'm playing Breakout with my little brother, for example, and just I'm better than him, well, I'm able to make the paddle smaller for me, so he has a little bit of an advantage, so it's a little more fair. They would add difficulty into the software that recognized the position of this switch. Now later, as other developers came along, they found other uses for the difficulty switch. In one player games, you didn't need a handicap. Ghostbusters comes to mind, where I think the left switch actually toggles saying I'm done doing inventory and the right switch allowed me to throw ghost bait. Uh, this was just a creative use of the difficulty switches that otherwise had never been intended it just was another way to use these. Look, Atari is a very simple device that has a stick and one button. So as developers and the game industry in general became a little more creative, they wanted more input and they were able to repurpose those difficulty switches to use in their games to do other things. Okay, let's talk about the color black and white switch and why it exists, first of all. Our beloved Atari VCS was released in September of 1977. And while color televisions had been out for a while in the late 70s, it wasn't absolutely a done deal that everyone was gonna have a color TV. So some families were playing Atari on their black and white TVs. If they did have a color TV, you know what that black and white TV became? The hand-me-down for the kids. So very often, if you wanted your own TV to play games on, you got the black and white TV that used to be in the living room before we upgraded to color in there. So playing games on a black and white TV, even in the late 70s, early 80s, was not unheard of and somewhat common. Now there's no reason you can't just send a color signal to a black and white TV and play the game on there. Black and white TVs handled that. So, but I think you understand, so color on a television is comprised of chrominance and luminance. What color is it and how bright is it? So look at this example where I have red, green, and blue dots. It's very clear to us on a color television which one is which. But if you pull the saturation out of this image, now you just have three big circles of equal brightness and it's hard to tell which one is which. It's not a big leap to imagine here I am playing Atari and I have a couple of objects on screen that are maybe red and blue. 
the same brightness but different saturation of color. But when you pull out the color, how do I know which one is which? So Atari's solution for those of us playing on black and white was to give us a little switch. I can tell the software I'll be playing this on a black and white TV. You make the necessary changes so I can differentiate different objects from the backgrounds or one another. I have a few examples here to illustrate this point and show you what I mean. So I have these two TVs side by side and I'm feeding a color signal to the one on the left and a black and white signal to the one on the right. The difference is I'm going to desaturate the colors from the one on the left and when I do, I want you to observe what parts of the screen or play field are not as easy to see when there's no saturation of color on this black and white TV. Sometimes the differences are minor, like just making things brighter and darker. Something that was red and blue will become black and white. In other cases, the difference between the color and black and white signal are very, very minor, and you might not be able to pick out the difference. The most glaring one that I want to show you is that original Pac-Man that came out on the Atari late in its life. Look how difficult it is to see Pac-Man man's play field and all the dots when you have a color signal going to a black and white TV versus the built-in black and white mode that Pac-Man had that made playing Pac-Man on a black and white TV actually tolerable. Now, we know we're living here in the 21st century, as I said, and almost no one has a black and white TV. And these gadgets that we're looking at don't even have a black and white mode, so why would anyone even care? Well, there are a couple of reasons that I think it's important to preserve and not forget about this color black and white switch. The first is just accuracy of emulation going forward in the future. If I want to be able to see how Atari games presented themselves when the black and white mode switch was enabled, as a fan of Atari and you know, kind of a, a, a backyard historian for Atari, I want to be able to look and see what these games look like, how they were played, especially for these early Atari games. This custom black and white mode may well be something that a lot of Atari players, unless they actually played back in the 70s and 80s on a black and white TV, may never have seen the games in this mode. Not having the switch in modern gadgets would be like finding out a book you love has a whole extra chapter you never noticed and then having it ripped out before it was placed in the library for you to go back and read. I think it's an interesting part of the history of Atari because of its longevity and its place in the history of video gaming. The other has to do with repurposing of that color black and white switch, which is usually the thing I'm bringing up when I'm talking about it. Just like those difficulty switches I talked about earlier in the video, as color black and white became not important, many developers, Atari themselves included, just stopped using that switch entirely. You'll even look in the manual that will say, color black and white switch does not function in this game. And that was all. But because games were starting to evolve a little bit, clever developers started to realize they could reuse that now forgotten color black and white switch and use it for other functions. Many times I bring up Star Master as the one that first comes to mind. You use that color black and white switch to go from the play field to the galactic map. Now I just recently learned that you can use the AB switch for that as well, the difficulty switch, but the manual didn't say so, so I always use that color black and white switch. Another one that comes to mind is uh, Space Shuttle, which actually used that switch to enable the engines or thrusters, I think, right? You had to do that. Now other games did interesting stuff with it, like enable a pause function. Here I'm playing Flash Gordon for the Atari 2600. You throw that switch down in black and white, it pauses the game and even cycles the colors to prevent burn-in on your old tube TV. I just find that infinitely interesting to see how people utilize that. And because today the Atari 2600 is far from a dead platform, there are so many clever homebrew developers who are putting new games into the Atari and are you know, revitalizing old games and building them in the Atari. This still is just a stick with one button to be able to use the difficulty switches and the color black and white switch. If they can rely on it being present in emulation hardware, you know, like these pocket players and things that are coming out now, then they will feel empowered to build that functionality into their games and not be hamstrung by worrying whether or not the switch is even going to be accessible or present on the hardware that it's going to be played on. I think what it ultimately boils down to, for me at least, is accuracy of Atari nostalgia and history. Look, I had a 2600 when I was seven or eight years old. It was one of my best friends. I played it with my other best friends. And seeing now that, you know, it's being reproduced, but they're excluding parts of it just feels, 
feels like you're dishonoring a, a dear friend, right? All of the functions that are on the original should be reflected going forward in devices that play those games for all the reasons I mentioned. Not the least of which, though, is just respect for this original legacy grandfather console that helped lay the groundwork for the gaming industry we know today, and it accomplished that work using that little color black and white switch. A quick shout out to Nerdly Pleasures, an article over there I read that kind of inspired me to do this video. I'll put a link down in the description. I'll also throw some links over my shoulders here of some other Atari videos we have done here on Gen X Grown Up. I certainly hope you found something to enjoy in this video. Can't wait to talk to you again next time. Bye-bye.